ऑनरेबल गवर्नर ऑफ कर्नाटक राजू भाई वाला जी ऑनरेबल चीफ जस्टिस ऑफ इंडिया जस्टिस जगदीश चंद्र खेर ऑनरेबल चीफ मिनिस्टर ऑफ कर्नाटक सीतारमैया जी डिग्नेटरीज ऑन द डायस ऑनरेबल जजेस डिग्नेटरीज इन द ऑडियंस लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन it is a privilege to be invited to this most prestigious of law schools in the country more so for someone not formally lettered in the discipline of law i thank the vice chancellor and the faculty for this honor the nebulous universe of law and legal procedures is well known to this audience and there is precariously little that i can say of relevance to them and for reasons of prudence and much else i dare not repeat here either mr bumble's remark that the law is an ass or the suggestion of a shakespearean character who outrageously proposed in henry the 6th to kill all lawyers instead my effort today would be to explore the practical implications that some constitutional principles legal dicta and judicial pronouncements have for the lives of citizens an interest in political philosophy has been a lifelong pursuit for me I recall John Locke's dictum that wherever law ends tyranny begins and also in my mind is John Rawls's assertion that justice is the first virtue of social institutions and that in a just society the liberties of equal citizenship are taken as settled and the rights secured by justice are not subject to political bargaining or to the calculus of social interests to rawls the first task of political philosophy is its practical role to see whether despite appearances on deeply disputed questions some philosophical or moral grounds can be located to further social cooperation on a footing of mutual respect amongst citizens the constitution of india and its preamble is an embodiment of the ideals and principles that i hold dear the people of india gave themselves a republic that is sovereign socialist secular democratic and a constitutional system with its focus on justice liberty equality and fraternity these have been embodied in a set of institutions and laws conventions and practices our founding fathers took cognizance of an existential reality ours is a plural society and a culture imbued with considerable doses of syncretism our population of 1.3 billion comprises of over 4635 communities 78% of whom are not only linguistic and cultural but social categories religious minorities constitute 19.4% of the total the human diversities are both hierarchical and spatial it is this plurality that the constitution endowed with a democratic polity and a secular state structure pluralism as a moral value seeks to transpose social plurality to the level of politics 
and to suggest arrangements which articulate plurality with a single political order in which all duly constituted groups and all individuals are actors on an equal footing reflected in the, unif in the uniformity of legal capacity. Pluralism in this modern sense presupposes citizenship. Citizenship as the basic unit is conceptualized as national civic rather than national ethnic, even as national identity remains a rather fragile construct, a complex and increasingly fraught national, civic, plural, ethnic combination. In the same way, Indianness came to be defined not as a singular or exhaustive identity, but as embodying the idea of layered Indianness and accretion of identities. Modern democracy offers the prospect of the most inclusive politics of human history. By the same logic, there is a thrust for exclusion that is a byproduct. has been debated extensively. A definitive pronouncement pertaining to it for purposes of statecraft in India was made by the Supreme Court in the Bomai case and bears reiteration. And I quote, secularism has both positive and negative contents, has been debated extensively. A definitive pronouncement pertaining to it for purposes of statecraft in India was made by the Supreme Court in the Bomai case and bears reiteration. And I quote, secularism has both positive and negative contents. The Constitution stuck a balance between temporal parts confining it to the person professing a particular religious faith or belief and allows him to practice, profess and propagate his religion subject to public order, morality and health. The positive part of secularism has been entrusted to the state to regulate by law or by an executive order. The state is prohibited to patronize any particular religion as state religion and is enjoined to observe neutrality. The state strikes a balance to ensure an atmosphere of full faith and confidence amongst its people to realize, their, to realize full growth of personality and to make him a rational being on secular lines to improve individual excellence, regional growth, progress and national integrity. Religious tolerance and fraternity are basic features and postulates of the Constitution as a scheme of national integration and sectional or religious unity. Programs or principles evolved by political parties based on religion amount to recognizing religion as a part of the political governance which the Constitution expressly forbids, prohibits, I beg your pardon. It violates the basic features of the Constitution. Positive secularism negates such a policy and any action in its furtherance thereof would be violative of the basic features of the Constitution, end of quote. 
Despite its clarity, various attempts, judicial and political, have been made to dilute its import and to read meanings into it. Credible critics, critics have opined that the December 11, 1995 judge of the principle of secular democracy, end of quote, and that a larger bench of the principle of secular democracy, end of quote, and that a larger bench should consider them, and I quote again, to undo the great harm caused by them, end of quote. This remains to be done. Instead, a regression of consciousness has set in and the slide is now sought to be accelerated and is threatening to wipe out even the gains of the national movement summed up in Sarmadhar Sambhav. It has been observed with much justice that the relationship between identity and inequality lies at the heart of secularism and democracy in India. The challenge today then is to reiterate and rejuvenate secularism's basic principles, equality, freedom of religion and tolerance, and to emphasize that equality has to be substantive, that freedom of religion be reinfused with its collectivist dimensions and that toleration should be reflective of the realities of Indian society and lead to acceptance. Friends, experience of almost seven decades sheds light on the extent of our success and of limitations on the actualization of these values and objectives. The optimistic narrative is of deepening, the grim narrative of decline or crisis. Three questions thus come to mind. One, how, are, how has the inherent plurality of our society reflected itself in the functioning of Indian democracy? Two, how has democracy contributed to the various dimensions of Indian pluralism? And three, how consistent are we in adherence to secularism? Our democratic polity is pluralist because it recognizes and endorses this plurality in its federal structure, linguistic and religious rights to minorities and a set of individual rights. The first has sought to contain, with varying degrees of success, regional pressures. The second has ensured space for religious and linguistic minorities. And the third protects freedom of opinion and the right to dissent. A question is of, often raised about national integration. Conceptually and practically, integration is not synonymous with assimilation or homogenization. Some years back, a political scientist had amplified the nuances, and I quote him, in the semantics of functional politics, the term National integration means and ought to mean cohesion and not fusion, unity and not uniformity, reconciliation and not merger, accommodation and not annihilation, synthesis and not dissolution, solidarity and not regimentation of the several discrete segments of the people constituting the larger political community. Obviously then, integration is not a process of conversion of diversities into a uniformity, but a congruence of diversities 
leading to a unity in which both the varieties and the similarities are maintained. End of quote. How and to what extent has this worked in the case of Indian democracy with its ground reality of exclusion arising from stratification, heterogeneity and hierarchy that often operate conjointly and create intersectionality? Given the pervasive inequalities and social diversities, the choice of a system committed to political inclusiveness what was itself a leap of faith. The Constitution instituted universal adult suffrage and a system of representation on the first past the post or the Westminster model. An underlying premise was the rule of law that is reflective of the desire of people to make power accountable, governance just, and state ethical. Much earlier, Gandhiji had predicted that democracy would be safeguarded if people have a keen sense of independence, self-respect, and their oneness, and should insist upon choosing as their representatives only persons as are good and true. This, when read alongside Ambedkar's apprehension that absence of equality and fraternity would bring forth a life of contradictions if the ideal of one person, one vote, one value was not achieved, framed the challenge posed by democracy. Any assessment of the functioning of our democracy has to be both procedural and substantive. On procedural counts, the system has developed roots with regularity of elections, efficacy of the electoral machinery, and in ever-increasing percentage of voter participation in the electoral process, and the formal functionings of the legislatures thus elected. The record gives cause for much satisfaction. The score is less emphatic on the substantive aspects. Five of these bear scrutiny. One, the gap between quality before the law and equal protection of the law. Two, representativeness of the elected representative. Three, functioning of legislatures, four, gender and diversity imbalance, and five, secularism in practice. I dwell on each one of them. One, equality before the law and equal protection of the law. The effort to pursue equality has been made at two levels. At one level was the constitutional effort to change the very structure of social relations. Practicing caste and untouchability was made illegal and allowing religious considerations to influence state activity was not permitted. At the second level, the effort was to bring about economic equality, although in this endeavor, the right to property and class inequality was not seriously curbed. Thus, the reference to economic equality in the Constitution, in the course or from political platforms, it remains basically rhetorical. Two, representativeness of the elected representative. In the 2014 general election, 61% of the elected members of parliament obtained less than 50% of the votes polled. This can be attributed in some measure to the first past the post system in a fragmented polity and multiplicity of parties and contestants. The fact nevertheless remains that representation obtained 
on non-majority basis does impact on the overall approach in which politics of identity prevails over the common interest. Secondly, the functioning of legislature's accountability and responsiveness. The primary task of legislators are legislation, seeking accountability of the executive, articulation of grievances, and discussion of matters of public concern. The three often overlap. All require sufficient time being made available. It is the latter that is now a matter of concern. The number of sittings of the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha, which stood at 137 and 100 respectively in the year 1953, declined to 49 and 52 in 2016. The paucity of time thus created results in shrinkage of space made available to each of these with the resultant impact on quality and productivity and a corresponding lessening of executive's accountability. According to one assessment made some years back, over 40% of the bills were passed in Lok Sabha with less than one hour of debate. The situation is marginally better in the Rajya Sabha. Substantive debates on public policy issues are few and far in between. More recently, the efficiency of the Standing Committee mechanism has been dented by resort to tactics of evasion by critical witnesses. A study on Indian Parliament as an instrument of accountability concluded that the institution is increasingly becoming ineffective in providing surveillance of the executive branch of the government. The picture with regard to the functioning of the state assemblies is generally much worse. Thus, while public participation in the electoral exercise has noticeably improved, public satisfaction with the functioning of the elected bodies is breeding cynicism with the democratic process itself. It has also been argued that the time has come to further commit ourselves to a deeper and more participatory and decentralized democracy, a democracy with greater congruence between people's interests and public policy. Fourth, gender and diverse imbalance. Women MPs constitute 12.15% of the total in 2014. This compares unfavorably globally as well as within SARC and is reflective of pervasive neo-patriarchal attitudes. The Women's Reservation Bill of 2009 was passed by the Rajya Sabha, was not taken up by the Lok Sabha, and lapsed when Parliament was dissolved before the 2014 general election. It has not been resurrected. Much the same for other reasons of perception and prejudice hold for minority representation. Muslims constitute 14.23% of the population of India. The total strength of the two houses of parliament is 790. The number of Muslim members of parliament stood at 49 in 1980, ranged between 30 and 35 in the 1999 to 2009 period, but declined to 23 in 2014. An expert committee report to the government some years back had urged the need for a diversity index to identify inequality traps which prevent the marginalized 
and work in favor of the dominant groups in society and result in unequal access to political power. That, in turn, determines the nature and functioning of institutions and policies. And five, secularism in actual practice. Experience shows that secularism has become a site for political and legal contestation. The difficulty lies in delineating for purposes of public policy and practice the line that separates them from religion. For this, religion per se and each individual religion figuring in the discourse has to be defined in terms of its stated tenets. The way of life argument used in philosophical texts and some judicial pronouncements does not help the process of identifying common principles of equity in a multi-religious society in which religious majority is not synonymous with totality of the citizen body. Since a wall of separation is not possible under Indian conditions, the challenge is to develop and implement a formula for equal distance and minimum involvement. For this purpose, principles of faith need to be segregated from contours of culture, since a conflation of the two obfuscates the boundaries of both and creates space to equal equivocalness. Furthermore, such an argument could be availed of by other faiths in the land, since all claim a cultural sphere and a historical justification for it. Ladies and gentlemen, in life as in law, terminological inexactitude has its implications. In electoral terms, majority is numerical majority as reflected in a particular exercise, for example, the election, uh, does not have permanence and is generally time-specific. The same holds for minority. Both find reflection in value judgments. In socio-political terminology, on the other hand, like in demographic data, majority and minority are terms indicative of settled situations. These two bring forth value judgments. The question then is whether in regard to citizenship under our constitution, with its explicit injunctions on rights and duties, any value judgment should emerge from expressions like majority and minority and the associated adjectives like majoritarian and majorityism and minoritarian and minorityism. Record shows that these have divisive implications and detract from the preamble's quest for fraternity. Within the same ambit, but distinct from it, is the constitutional principle of equality of status and opportunity amplified through Articles 14, 15, and 16. This equality has to be substantive rather than merely formal and has to be given shape through requisite measures of affirmative action needed in each case so that the journey on the path to development has a common starting point. This would be an effective way of giving shape to Prime Minister Narendra Modi's policy of Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas. It is here that the role of the judicial arm of the state comes into play and as an acknowledged authority on the constitution has put it, unless the court strives in every possible way to assure that the constitution, the law applies fairly to all citizens, the court cannot
be said to have fulfilled its custodial responsibility. How then, friends, do we go about creating conditions and space for a more comprehensive realization of the twin objectives of pluralism and secularism and in weaving it into the fabric of a comprehensive actualization of the democratic objectives set forth in the Constitution? The answer would seem to lie firstly in the negation of the impediments to the accommodation of diversity institutionally and among citizens and secondly in the rejuvenation of the institutions and practices through which pluralism and secularism cease to be sites for political legal contestation in the functioning of the Indian democracy. The two approaches are to be parallel, not sequential. Both necessitate avoidance of sophistry in discourse or induction of personal inclination in state practice. A more diligent promotion of fraternity and of our composite culture in terms of Article 51A, E and F is clearly required. It needs to be done in practice by leaders and followers. A commonplace suggestion is advocacy of tolerance. Tolerance is a virtue. It is freedom from bigotry. It is also a pragmatic formula for the functioning of society without conflict between different religious political ideologies, religions, political ideologies, nationalities, ethnic groups, and other us versus them divisions. Yet, tolerance alone is not a strong enough foundation for building an inclusive and pluralistic society. It must be coupled with understanding and acceptance. We must as Swami Vivekananda said, not only tolerate other religions, but positively embrace them as truth is the basis of all religions. Acceptance goes a step beyond tolerance. Moving from tolerance to acceptance is a journey that starts within ourselves, within our own understanding and compassion for the people who are different to us and from our recognition and acceptance of the other, that is the raison d'etre of democracy. The challenge is to look beyond the stereotypes and preconditions that prevent us from accepting others. This makes continuous dialogue unavoidable. It has to become an essential national virtue to promote harmony transcending sectional diversities. The urgency of giving this a practical shape at national, state, and local levels through various suggestions in the public domain is highlighted by enhanced apprehensions of insecurity among segments of our citizen body, particularly Dalits, Muslims, and Christians. The alternative, however unpalatable, also has to be visualized. There is evidence to suggest that we are a polity at war with itself, in which the process of emotional integration has faltered and is in dire need of reinvigoration. On one plane is the question of our commitment to the rule of law, that seems to be under serious threat arising out of the noticeable decline in the efficacy of the institutions of the state, lapses into arbitrary decision-making and even ochlocracy or mob rule. 
and the resultant public disillusionment. On another are questions of fragility and cohesion emanating from impulses that have shifted the political discourse from mere growth centric to vociferous demands for affirmative action and militant protest politics. A culture of silence has yielded to protests. The vocal distress in the farms sector in different states, the persistence of Naxalite insurgencies, the re-emergence of language-related identity questions, seeming indifference to excesses pertaining to weaker sections of society, and the as yet unsettled claim of local nationalisms can no longer be ignored or brushed under the carpet. The political immobility in relation to Jammu and Kashmir is disconcerting. Alongside are questions about the functioning of what has been called our asymmetrical foundation and the felt need for a wider, reinvigorated perspective on the shape of the Union of India to overcome the crisis of moral legitimacy in its different manifestations. I have in the foregoing dwelt on two isms, two value systems, and the imperative need to invest them with greater commitment in word and deed so that the principles of the Constitution and the structures emanating from it are energized. Allow me to refer to a third ism that is foundational for the modern state is not of recent origin, but much in vogue in an exaggerated manifestation. I refer here to nationalism. Scholars have dwelt on the evolution of the idea. The historical precondition of Indian identity was one element of it. So was the regional and anti-colonial patriotism. By 1920s, a form of pluralistic nationalism had answered the question of how to integrate within it the divergent aspirations of identities based on regional vernacular cultures and religious communities. A few years earlier, Rabindranath Tagore had expressed his views on the, what he called idolatry of nation. For many decades after independence, a pluralist view of nationalism and Indianness, reflective of the widest possible circle of inclusiveness and a salad bowl approach, characterized our thinking. More recently, an alternate viewpoint of purifying exclusivism has tended to intrude into and take over the political and cultural landscape. One manifestation of it is an increasingly fragile national ego that threatens to rule out any dissent, however innocent. Hypernationalism and the closing of the mind is also a manifestation of insecurity about one's place in the world. While ensuring external and domestic security is an essential duty of the state, there seems to be a trend towards sanctification of military might, overlooking George Washington's caution to his countrymen over two centuries earlier about overgrown military establishments which under any form of government are inauspicious to liberty. Citizenship does imply national obligations. It necessitates adherence to and affection for the nation in all its diversity. This is what nationalism means and should mean in a global community of nations. 
The Israeli scholar Yale Tamir has dwelt on this at some length. Lib liberal nationalism, she opines, and I quote her, requires a state of mind characterized by tolerance and respect of diversity for members of one's own group and for others. Hence, it is polycentric by definition and celebrates the particularity of culture with the universality of human rights, the social and cultural embeddedness of individuals together with their personal autonomy. On the other hand, the version of nationalism that places cultural commitments at its core is usually perceived as the most conservative and illiberal form of na nationalism. It promotes tolerance and arrogant patriotism." End of quote. What are or could be the implications of the latter for pluralism and secularism. It is evident that both would be abridged since both require for their sustenance a climate of opinion and a state practice that eschews intolerance, distances itself from extremist and illiberal nationalism, subscribes in word and deed to the Constitution and its preamble, and ensures that citizenship irrespective of caste, creed, or ideological affiliation is the sole determinant of Indianness. In our plural, secular democracy, therefore, the other is to be none other than the self. Any derogation from it would be detrimental to its core values. Jai Hind. Heard in my home. Give me a second.